Hello, everyone. Thank you so much um, for waiting a little bit. I know it's a little past 12 and we have it scheduled for 12. This is um, Deja Kidd speaking. I am Senator Ingram, senior legislative aide. Um, Senator Ingram's having some, she's trying to get logged on now. However, we do have Representative Juanita Brent on the call. And unfortunately, Senator Hicks Hudson was not able to be here today due to circumstances that came up. So we still plan to have, we wanted to still have the meeting considering folks, um, you know, knew this was coming and it's important topics to discuss. So um, we will still have the meeting and we will kind of go over um, a few different topics that pertain to Black Patrol Health as it relates to the operating budget. So we can probably let a few more folks see if folks will join on. If not, then we can, um, we can go ahead and get started. I don't want to keep folks waiting any longer. All right, and we're just waiting to get the screen share pulled up so that we can have um, so everyone can see our PowerPoint we created for today. We still have some folks joining us. All right, thank you, Margaret. Margaret is Senator Hicks Hudson's aide. She's helping me, she helps in the caucus. Um, and so, yeah. So for today, we this is our agenda. We obviously have our arrivals and welcomes. And so we're welcoming um, Representative Juanita Brent um, to the call today. We intended to have this panel type discussion um, about the operating budget. Um, we will go over our mission statement just so folks can understand the intentions of the Black Maternal Health Caucus and its purpose. Um, and then we will do kind of a brief overview of what is infant mortality, uh, since that is kind of obviously the pressing issue at hand. And then we will, there's four big areas that we're focusing on in terms of the, the operating budget as it was passed. Um, and then these areas we felt most important to highlight as they pertain to black maternal health. And then we can have questions if folks have those at the end of the meeting as well. Margaret, if you you can go to the next slide, that's fine. So the intention of the Black Maternal Health Caucus is that as a caucus, the legislators come together to you know raise awareness within Ohio um, to establish Black maternal health as a statewide priority. Um, and with the caucus, the caucus being kind of a channel or space for legislators, stakeholders, um, and our constituents to come together. Um, to address this issue through advocacy efforts, partnerships, education, um, innovative and evidence-informed, evidence culturally competent policies um, for health outcomes that benefit the long-term well-being of Black mothers, babies, and families. And then just a sidebar, someone asked if we were on mute. So everyone in the audience is going to be on mute because it is a webinar style Zoom conference. Um, so you're more than welcome to utilize the Q&A section. Um, it should be at the bottom of your Zoom page. And so like any questions, comments, concerns that you have, you can put them in the Q&A and then we're, as the panelists were able to, to view them and read them. And if you have questions, we will get to them at the end of, our, of the end of the, the meeting. Uh, Margaret, you're good to go next. So before we get into the specific budget provisions, um, I think it's, we all think it's very important to first make sure that everyone understands what you know, infant mortality is, that's the big issue. Um, and, you know, um, this graph here, some of you all may be familiar with it, some of you may not. Um, it's just simply depicting 
the um, you know, severity of the issue, whereas you can see at the higher point of the graph for black mothers and babies, well, for black babies, um, they have a very significantly higher rate for infant mortality opposed to the average for the state of Ohio, which is seven, and then compare, comparable, especially to the white counterparts where you can see it most recently in 2021, um, white infant mortality was down at 5.4%, whereas black infant mortality was at 14.2%. And so it's really important to understand these kind of dynamics um, to make better informed decisions when we're, you know, well, the legislators or advocacy groups are doing their work to bring awareness to this issue and trying to understand, well, why is there such this large gap between, um, between folks, between black and white folks um, in the state of Ohio. And Ohio is also ranked um, 41 um, for their infant mortality rates, which is not very good. We're close to the bottom out of all the United States. So that's why this is such a pressing matter. And so <clears throat> you can go to the next slide. So the next slide, um, so the, the, well, I will say these graphics are from the Health Policy Institute of Ohio, and they came to our Joint Medicaid Oversight Committee um, this past month and had we had a specific committee meeting sp on this topic. So we had various groups come in and present information and the work that they're doing in regard to addressing this issue. So infant mortality in the red light words, you can see kind of where people may assume these are the more known causes um, for infant mortality. So preterm birth or low birth weight or birth defects or accidents and injuries to the child. Um, but the reality is, and with the iceberg image is that you know, below the surface or really on the surface, there's a lot of things that come together to impact the um, health outcomes of black mothers and babies, whether it be, you know, um, poverty, lack of transportation, homelessness or housing insecurity, air and water pollution, um, chronic health conditions. So as you can see, it's a, it's a plethora of things that actually contribute to infant mortality um, and so that's why it's so important to look at the issue from all angles and have those partnerships and have this caucus so that we can bring all folks to the table who are working to address this issue because it can be what coming from very different um, areas of how to address the issue. So it's important to, to consider that intersectional work to address this issue. Um, you can go to the next slide. And so, the next slide here is just kind of one of the last overview um, images that um, I had just so everyone can be more informed on the issue. So again, this is from the Health Policy Institute. It says summary of relationships between social drivers of health and infant mortality and social drivers of health, or it, you might've heard social determinants of health, things like that. When you have a social determinant of health that could be based on um, the family's income, where they live, what job they might have, what level of education they may have. Um, those kinds of factors can determine, determine you know, the health outcomes for individuals if you're considering those factors as well. It's not simply um, clinical, like when you go to the doctor and you're healthy or not, there's a lot of other factors like having lack of transportation or a big one for this specific issue is the toxic and persistent stress or trauma of racism and things like that, that specifically impact black moms, which can make them having a harder birth, a harder pregnancy, whether that be you know racial bias in the hospital or external factors out of the hospital. Those all come together, as you can see in this kind of chart, um, that can lead to those poor health outcomes. And so Representative Brent, if you would like to um, speak on the housing supports or however you want to um, go into the next slide here, um, if you wanna go ahead and start expanding on 
some of the things that were included in the budget and um, do a little more in-depth conversation about that if you'd like. Thank you, Deja. You know, our, our state budget is a reflection of how we really feel about Ohio families. And one of the ways that, you know, since the creation of the Black Maternal Health Caucus, it's talking about housing support. So this is a, a glimpse of what is needed, but not particularly, we haven't reached the pinnacle of the $100 million for um, the state multifamily housing tax credit. And even when it comes to that, this is helpful, but um, it's not enough because we definitely need a place where it's going directly to owner occupied places and not just for people who are building it. And so this tax credit is is helpful, but it's, it's at the same time, we wanna make sure that people can be able to build up the generational wealth um, to keep things affordable and not just more opportunity for renters. Um, also putting more money towards the single family housing development, which is also very important. Um, we have a lot of folks that if you really want to talk about um, dealing with um, affordable housing is making sure that people have access to affordable single family um, houses. So the $50 million is a uh, pull in the bucket because we can even just say, if we look at just Cleveland, it was reported that just for Cleveland at least, and I hope my, it's not a type of a bad feedback, but even just for the Cleveland area, they needed about 200 million just for Cleveland. So 50 million just for our state is just a, a drop in the bucket of where we need to be as a whole. Um, and then all of this just goes back to the direct correlation that if you have stable housing, affordable housing, um, and access to other key things, this will help bring down the, um, the contributors of Black maternal mortality and morbidity, and also um, decrease infant mortality within our communities. We can go on to the next slide. SNAP, food banks and public child care, Interested enough, I feel like one of the things we had to fight for the most, particularly, was making sure that our food banks have food. Um, there was the allocation that was received in this state budget. Um, it, it was this amount, but obviously, I always like to say it's never enough when it comes to this because we're dealing with a lot of families of not just people who just aren't working, a lot of the people who are benefits of SNAPs and food banks are people who are working jobs, but you know, they're 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 working more than you know than they're actually getting paid in the long term so having food banks in our communities are essential it's not just uh, something that is wanted but it's something that's needed because we have an access to fresh fruits vegetables um and also having um, services to to snap and wick which is all tied in together so vital because we need to make sure to have healthy babies. We have to make sure we have healthy moms and all that is tied into how we deal with food. Publicly funded child care, I can never say this enough. We do not have enough of this. Um, thank goodness we have, um, you know, increase the amount for the publicly funded child care. Definitely not where the governor had us at, but it's definitely higher than what we had it at before. And it will allow more people, more families to be able to have access to child care. During the pandemic, we lost a lot of, you know, child care options here within the state of Ohio. So hopefully this will help a lot of our small business owners who want to open back up because this will increase the eligibility for more people to have access to child care. Um, and when people are in child care, this means they have more access to resources of kids having um, the ability to, to learn more um, and different other social determinants that are helpful. And also the basic thing of allowing people to go to work. If people do not have childcare, then people cannot go to work or go to school or, or different other things within their community. So we can go to the next slide. Um, Rep. Brent, do you care if we um, just I say something on the food banks real quick? Sure. Yeah, if you can. Um, so and then on the point too, is like as Rep. Representative Brent was saying with with having food, it's so crucial to have food. You know, a lot of the time 
where um, we're seeing higher rates of infant mortality. For example, Cradle Cincinnati came to JMOC and presented and actually showed us a map breakdown of Cincinnati by zip code showing where areas have the higher rates. And typically those areas might have more poverty and things like that. And not only that, it's these areas might not have, if, if, if you've heard the term like a food desert, um, you know, that means that there's not a grocery store located within that community within, a, I think it's 10 miles or a reasonable distance. So then people aren't able to even go to the grocery store if, you know, there's no grocery store within their area. So food banks are typically right in the neighborhood or, you know, where the people need it. So that's also just a really crucial point um, and why food is so important and why funding food banks and and having that in there and getting them more money is a really important, um, you know, point as well. And so Rep Brent, the Healthy Beginnings at Home, I did a little bit of a, we, I wanted to do a little more of a closer look at this program um, to, because this program in the budget specifically had received a very significant cut to their funding. Um, it was 81% was cut from their funding um, over the governor's recommendation. And this program was really unique and important because it was a program to house pregnant women and families who were homeless or at risk for homelessness. And when you cut the funding for a program like this, it doesn't allow for that program to continue doing the work and um, the uh, level of work that they want to do when you know they, they did um, produce positive outcomes when they did provide this intervention. Um, Rep. Brent, I'm sorry, I don't know if you want to speak some more on that, but I just wanted to clarify, it's kind of a longer slide, and then I included some, um, the report from Healthy Beginnings at Home and how they were able to help moms um, when they, when they interve intervened and provided them housing and how it impacted their birth outcomes, opposed to those who did not have access to the same intervention. I always go back to the point that our, our budget is a is a representation of how we feel about the people of Ohio. And if we are a pro-family and we are concerned about babies and being, um, you know, the pro-life state, then pro-life, it starts at birth to death. And one of those things is making sure we have affordable housing. And affordable housing is dealing, is, is what this program is doing. So for us to have these type of cuts, it's basically telling Ohioans, we do not care about mothers and their babies. Um, within the state of Ohio. And we're looking at a time where people are spending more than a third of their income on housing, um, particularly when it comes to mothers. We have to make sure in the next biennial um, budget that this program is increased. Um, we can't talk about people, you know, even putting money money towards other things in life, such as their public transit public transportation or making sure they're eating healthy food if they cannot afford their their rent or where they're living. So all of this goes into factors that leads on to stress uh, with also long-term hurts the mother, which hurts the baby um, in the process of which causes higher infant mortality within our community. So this is all interconnected to what we're doing. Thank you, Deja. Of course. And um, so if you all want to look at this, this is just what I pulled from the Healthy Beginnings at Home report. Um, I can kind of go over it really quickly. They had a survey group of about 100 mothers who are at risk for homelessness or were homeless. And as you can see by um, looking at the graph, the group that had received the intervention um, reported to have a 78% um, full-term healthy birth weight um, when when they were you know giving birth, opposed to the control group, which is the group who did not receive the intervention, they only had a 55% rate of full-term healthy birth weight um, pregnancies and births for their their baby. So they, I will point out that because this group 
the survey they did was a, a smaller group. So it was a hundred people. Um, when you do a smaller survey like that, it's, it's harder to um, generalize it and say, oh, well, this is like factual. I mean, well, it is factual, but basically you just need a larger survey to continue to provide that evidence-based um, like informed practice, you know, to say this is what works and we should continue funding it. But then with the 81% cut to this program, it's hard for the program to continue doing these kinds of surveys, this kind of work in these interventions when they're, you know, they're not receiving the same amount, a significant less amount of funding to be able to provide these kinds of um, interventions. And so I just think that was really important to see how they did have a positive outcome. Although it was a small survey group, it's almost as if since they received such a significant cut, what would it have looked like if this was able to be a larger like statewide um, survey with more participants and seeing those results. But unfortunately with that cut to funding, it may be harder for them to achieve such a larger scale um, survey and intervention for those folks. And so, um, as I mentioned earlier, Senator Hicks Hudson was unable to attend today's meeting um, due to unforeseen circumstances. And so um, we were, I spoke with Senator Ingram about, we still wanted to obviously have the meeting. Um, however, just giving Senator Hicks Hudson the opportunity to speak more to the bill that she did along with Senator Reynolds, um, Senate Bill 93. So, um, we will probably be having our another meeting, like our another monthly meeting next month, where we will spend more time to have the sponsors of the bill be able to speak towards the bill and um, just more in-depth conversation about that. Um, however, we can talk about the continuous coverage or the removal of the Medicaid expansion. Rep Brent, if you wanna speak to that or I can go over it. Um, yeah, I can, I'll be really quick and we can tag team on this. Um, for those who, this is your first GA or your first, this bill originally came from, this bill has been in existence for trying to get this done for at least the third General Assembly right now. And Commissioner Crawley, Erica Crawley, when she first came in, introduced this bill and it would get momentum. Her and the um, Honorable Brinkman, who is not in the General Assembly anymore, have been trying to do this for two solid General Assemblies. This is the third general assembly that is being introduced. And I always go back to the point, like how much do we care about being a pro-life state if we are not trying to take care of from birth through all the way through life. And it is being scientifically proven that those who receive, receive doula services have better maternal outcomes and also have their, there's better, their lower infant mortality rates that are all interconnected within this program. And this is part of the as is version of the budget. So it's really our fault as general assembly members on why this has not been put all the way through in the state budget. Um, so we just have to do better as a state. Um, so um, Rep. Brent, just to um, make a point to that. So the doula bill was included. It did end up getting included in the budget. And the issue was where the governor had to veto some of the lines in the um, version that was included in the Senate version of the budget um, because it was in the older language from the previous, maybe previous GA or previous language of the, of the doula bill. So on a positive note, the governor did um, basically make it so that the most very recent language um, as Senator Hicks Hudson and Senator Reynolds introduced was what would be in the budget. So I guess that's a win. Um, however, I do not believe that it's had, um, it's not been heard on the floor um, in the Senate as the standalone bill. Um, just to clarify that um, for folks. So it was in the budget but then it didn't, it has not made it through the complete process of what a standalone bill goes through um, in the legislature. 
Um, and then the other two points that we have on here, and like I said, we can have, we will, we plan to have maybe our next meeting to talk more in depth about this and have the sponsors of the bill talk about it in the process. Um, and maybe just more in depth about those veto changes and what that looked like and maybe the intentions behind the importance of having it be a permanent program versus the five-year program that it was in the old language. Um, and so the other two points on Medicaid are um, continuous coverage. So Medicaid eligible children are able to receive Medicaid coverage, continuous Medicaid coverage from birth through age three. And then there was a removal of a Medicaid expansion um, initiative where the governor had proposed a Medicaid expansion for kids and pregnant women that fell under 30% of the federal poverty limit. Um, and this was actually removed in the final budget. So the doulas were able to get in the budget with the most updated language. Um, and we had continuous coverage for children from birth to age three, but then we just had that removal of the Medicaid expansion, which would have been able to touch more working class folks and things like that. So that's something to look at as well, maybe in our ongoing conversations. And so I do just have um, a slide of questions. Um, I don't know, uh, Rep. Brett, if you wanna go back to any slides to speak more to them or going back to you know the causes of infant mortality or things like that, um, you can definitely um, have the opportunity to speak on that. Sorry, uh, Senator Ingram wasn't able to hop on and um, Senator Hicks Hudson, but they will both be on the call for our next month's meeting. So Rep. Brent, if you have... Um, Let's see, Senator Ingham actually just texted me. Rep. Brent, if you have anything else you want to want us to go back to, revisit. No, um, it's just Ohio still has a lot of work to do to get us from being number 41 in the nation to a higher rating. So I think the biggest thing we always have to remember as we are trying to work on this is making sure we right size what needs to be done. And that also when it comes to the thing, there's no one size fit all when it comes to this. And, you know, a lot of these things is, is rooted in, it is stressful being black here. And so that's why we are just seeing if we are not dealing with those stressors, of not dealing with um, food deserts, affordable housing, access to public transit. Um, we're not dealing with um, just different social factors, making sure that people have access to doulas we are going to continue to have problems with having high infant mortality within the state of Ohio and also black, I mean, black maternal morbidity. Mortality. Yes, and I think that you make a very good point on those, you know, those topics and understanding that obviously this work is hopefully at, we'll get to a point where the work can f not necessarily feel done, but can feel like we've accomplished, you know, these goals of reversing these um, poor outcomes. But like you said, the reality is it, it's not just gonna come by doing one, one thing. It, it has to be a collaborative and intersectional effort to address all of these other factors that impact the health outcomes, you know, public transportation, having dignified jobs and wages, protecting, you know, renters and making it accessible to even be homeowners, um, quality, equitable education throughout the state, and just having all those opportunities for all folks um, equally and equitably um, to attain that. And just constantly remembering, actively remembering, whether as an individual or, you know, as legislators, like Rep. Brent said, to remember all of these when we're um, attempting to address an issue such as this, considering we are ranked 41 in the nation, which is um, pretty pretty stark statistic um, and kind of a scary statistic. So I think it's just super important to constantly um, be thinking about these things and how they work together. So. Um, 
if Rep Brent, I don't know if Margaret wants to say anything. I know her. This is Margaret is Rep Hicks or Senator Hicks Hudson's aide. Um, but if no one else has any questions, or if you have questions, you can put them in the Q and A. I know it was a little shorter and we didn't have some members on, but please look forward to our next meeting next month where we can get everyone together and you know continue this conversation. So if anyone has questions, definitely feel free. Um, if not, then thank you all for joining the call today and working with us. Um, and I hope you learned something and were able to take something away from today's meeting um, moving forward. So I will read some messages from the Q&A. Um, Representative Holmes did say in the, in the chat that um, they have some bipartisan work ongoing to re-energize the responsibilities of fatherhood in Ohio. And it says, would you have any thoughts on the role of fatherhood and how it could you know, impact or how does that factor with infant mortality? Um, Representative Brent, if you wanna answer this, Hey, thanks, Rep. Holmes, for being a part of this. And as we talk about making sure that we decrease the numbers of um, Black infant mortality as well as um, maternal morbidity and mortality, a lot of the groups that we are partnering with, with to do this also do have the, they all of these programs from Birth and Beautiful Communities to Cradle Cincinnati. There is a portion of it that also deals with the father too within all of this. That so the fathers have not been left out in this conversation at, at all and they're a, a vital part of what makes our, our family as whole so i'm um, thank you for bringing a, that up yeah i think that i agree with you know what you said representative friend it is important to you know remember the fathers in this conversation um and to make sure that they are part of the conversation because obviously they are. And um, something that Senator Ingram and I had um, talked about was kind of seeing maybe next steps within the caucus or things like that as a, as a caucus, like what we could do to kind of um, also bring fathers in. And, and even within the caucus, like having men in the caucus is important because it's not you know, it's not just the mom and the baby, it impacts the father, it impacts the family, and it really impacts the community as a whole. So I think that's really important to remember and include actively including um, them in this conversation as well. And I'm checking the Q&A to see if we have any more questions. Um, let's see. Thank you, perfect. Yes, you're welcome, Rep. Rep. Holmes. Thank you for your question. Um, let's see. All right, I don't see any more questions, I believe, in the chat. So if there's no more questions, um, typically we do have our Black Maternal Health Caucus meetings. Um, normally it was the third Thursday, but then we're kind of flexible, whereas today we're on the fourth Thursday of the month. Um, so we typically just do it towards end of the month on the Thursday around noon. Um, and so you can look forward to that meeting for next month. And <clears throat> just to remind folks, we did send out an email um, in the last two weeks, we had an interested member meeting. So for members on the call in the House and the Senate, we did send out information if you would like to formally like say that you're wanting to be a part of the caucus. So not just attending these meetings, but actively like being within the, the membership of the Black Maternal Health Caucus as well to work on legislation and policy ideas and you know different events and district regarding this topic. So um, if you're interested in that or wanted to find more information about that, you can feel free to reach out to Senator Ingram's office or Senator Hicks Hudson. Um, and yeah, if not, then I think that's kind of all we have for today. Again, thank you all for being on. Thank you, Representative Brent, for being on the call with us today and for your um, insightful comments. And I really appreciate everyone listening today.